Good morning, guys, and welcome to Sojourn Community Church. We're so glad that you're here with us for another online service. Here at Sojourn, we want you to know that we love you and that we're still praying for you. And please let us know if there's anything that we can do for you. Don't hesitate to reach out to one of your elders. And again, thank you for joining us in this service. We hope you enjoy it. Peace. How can we stay silent when the noise of praise has gone? Our tongues can't dare keep quiet till His righteousness shines like the dawn. How can we grow tired when His return is nigh? The skyline will burn bright again like a diadem on the crown of Christ. A brand new name, straight from the mouth of God, the orphan ones now take. And through the waning years, He preserves His own in a city no longer forsaken. open grace and how can we withhold our prayers to the God who shares all who seek his face a brand new land till by his tender hand the thorns and thistles break from the desert sand a harvest comes in a city no longer forsaken
Happy Mother's Day, Sojourn. We hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday for our online gathering. Moms, you are a gift to our community. You represent and display uh, God's compassion, his warmth, his hospitality, his love. We are so grateful for you moms of Sojourn. We hope that you have a great day. We also recognize that on Mother's Day, this can be a difficult day for many of the ladies in our church, that there are some ladies who long to be mothers, and maybe you're still single, maybe you're struggling with infertility. For whatever reason, you want children, and the Lord just hasn't made that dream come true yet. We also want to acknowledge you on this day, and we want to honor you. We actually have these flowers here for you, ladies, who desire to be mothers and are not yet mothers. We have these flowers for you, uh, really to remind you of several things during this sermon. The first thing is we want the beauty of these flowers to remind you that in the same way that these flowers, they grew up among thorns and thistles. In the same way, you have beautiful desires for a family, and the thorns and the thistles of life have choked those out. But we want you to know that God is faithful to bring beauty out of those desires that you have. These flowers also remind all of us that the flower and the grass will wither, but that the word of the Lord and that pleasures at the right hand of the Lord will remain forevermore. And finally, we want these flowers to remind you this morning that you are beautiful to God and that you're beautiful to us, your church family. We love you and we're praying for you this morning. As we start out today, uh, let me ask a question to you, and that is, have you ever heard the word eucatastrophe? It's one of those words that sounds like a made-up word. Uh, my wife, Rachel, and I, we actually play a game in our home where she questions and doubts words that I use as being real words, and then we ask the Google, and then we find out who is right. It's a really fun game that we play pretty regularly. And of course, a gentleman would never tell who wins the most. So I'm just not going to. That will have to be left up to your imagination. But this word eucatastrophe, uh, it's one of those words that my Rachel would say, that's not a real word. It's a made up word. And in fact, she would be right. It is a made up word, which I guess all words are made up now that I think about it. But uh, it is a word that was made up by J.R.R. Tolkien. And he used this word so regularly in how he told his stories. Eucatastrophe and his understanding of this word meant a happy disaster. That prefix you there is the Greek prefix for good or for happy. So you have a happy disaster or a good catastrophe. And if you've ever read or watched Lord of the Rings, for all of you out there who have never done that, and that's some kind of like badge of honor for you that you've never dove into the Lord of the Rings universe, um, that's fine. You just enjoy yourself. Not sure what's going on there. But for all of you who have, you've seen this in his stories, right, where the hero um, will get into trouble and one thing after another after another will go wrong. And you think, how on earth will our heroes make it out of this catastrophe? And then at the very last moment, some series of events come about and surprises us and we find our heroes make it out. They are saved. They are rescued. That's what the word eucatastrophe means. And last week we saw Jesus, he broke the seven seals to initiate God's plan to eradicate evil from the world. And in light of the earth shattering events in chapter six, chapter six ends with a question. Who can stand? And if you remember all of the events of chapter six, we would rightly think no one can stand. No one can endure the disaster and the catastrophes that we saw in chapter six. Yet like any good eucatastrophe, chapter seven comes along and it surprises us by showing us those who can stand. And the big idea from this passage today that we're going to look at is this. Love does all to rescue. We're going to look in this passage at God's people sealed, God's people rescued, and finally God's people 
loved. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. We're going to read the entire thing. And stand with me, sit with me, do whatever you're comfortable with where you can fully engage in the Word of God. So sojourn, hear the Word of the Lord and respond with the underlying portion. Here we go. Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Sojourn, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. God, thank you for this amazing vision of heaven. I pray that it would deeply touch us and change us today. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to know just another glimpse, another aspect and depth and the breadth and the length of your love this morning. And would we be changed? Would we be transformed forever? Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, let's look at God's people sealed in verses 1 to 8. Now, last week, we talked about chapters 6 through 16, three cycles of seven judgments describing the increase of evil in the world. I also mentioned that in those seven judgments, we see different angles of what God is up to in the midst of the evil in our world. Now, chapter 7 here that we're in this week is an interlude in the midst of the seven seals. We leave the chaos of earth momentarily, and we move into the calm of heaven. We pause the reality that we see day in and day out in order that we might see beyond it to a truer reality. So what is God up to in light of increasing sin and suffering in the world? Chapter 7 tells us God is sealing a people. He is setting apart. He is marking out a people for himself. And the number we read a few minutes ago of the sealed 
is 144,000 sealed from every tribe of Israel. We saw that in verse 4. Now, depending on your view of the end times, that shapes who you think these people are. So some believe this is a remnant of ethnic Israel that will be saved either after or during the seven-year tribulation that, uh, G- that will happen before Jesus returns. However, most numbers in the book of Revelation are not literal, but they are symbolic. So instead of viewing this as a literal number of ethnic Israelites, context tells us this is symbolism for the people of God. If you were to fast forward to Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, we would see the 144,000 again, and there they are described as the redeemed, the rescued church, God's people. Also, we see we have the same pattern here in chapter 7 that we had back in chapter 5. It's not going to be the last time we see this pattern as well. If you remember, back in chapter 5, John heard with his ears. John heard, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And remember, he turned and he saw the lamb who was slain. Here in chapter 7, John hears the number 144,000, and then in verse 9, he turns and he sees a great multitude. So the 144,000, the great multitude, that is the same group, the redeemed, the rescued church of God. But if we want to be even more specifically, John is talking about the church here in terms of an army. So those lists between verses 5 to 8 of, you know, the 12,000 from every tribe of Israel, that's a military census. And we get those uh, in the Old Testament in places like the book of Numbers. Yet there's one very important difference between the Old Testament military census of Israel and now this symbolism of this military census, and it's this. In the Old Testament, the first tribe to be mentioned every time was the firstborn Reuben. Here it is the tribe of Judah. Why is that? It's because Jesus is the lion-like lamb of the tribe of Judah. And so the message that's coming through loud and clear to us is God seals a people for himself. We could also say it like God secures a people for himself through the sacrificial death of his son, Jesus, the lamb of God. And those who trust in Jesus, they are held secure. Sojourn, God holds your very life. No matter what disasters, no matter what catastrophes are going on around you, God has got you. And even if you are wondering why God is allowing suffering or evil in your life, it does not change the fact that God has interrupted that evil through the cross of his son Jesus, and he has sealed you. The Apostle Paul goes on to talk in Ephesians about how God actually seals us through the Holy Spirit. And in so doing, he secures for us our inheritance of eternal life. What good news. Second, let's look at God's people rescued in verses 9 to 12. Now we see here a multicultural and uncountable group of people, the redeemed, rescued church of God. And they're standing before the throne of God with white garments and with palm branches in his hands, in their hands. And both of those are images of victory after a war. And how shocking and surprising is that? Especially that would have been shocking for Christians in the first century, because remember, the church in the first century, they were small, they were underground. The powers of Rome were dominating them with persecution, and how easy would it have been for them to have felt as if God had forgotten them or abandoned them? Yet, this vision of true reality shows them that in the midst of all of that evil, when it seems like evil is winning the day, the book of Revelation comes through with this vision and says, no, God is drawing people to himself 
an uncountable number from all over the world. And all those who will trust in Jesus will come before the throne with these white garments and with these palm branches. And friends, we see described here a rescue that is not a small rescue. I believe when we get to heaven that we will be shocked by how far God's grace has reached into our world. There will be an uncountable, multicultural group of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And this group, they cry out in verse 10, saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Man, that's a great prayer. That is a great way to praise God, to pray that to him. And we see here that God rescues because God loves us. Love does all to rescue. Remember from last week, chapter 6 showed us that evil will do its worst before the end in order to try to destroy us. Evil will do its worst. Chapter 7 here shows us that God gave his best in Jesus to rescue us. And Jesus, the very God of very God, he became man. Why? Because in becoming a man, he could then die. And in dying, he was then able to become the sacrificial lamb that each and every one of us needs for rescue. God let evil do its worst on Jesus. And ironically, paradoxically, as Jesus sacrificially laid down his life for others in love, Jesus undid evil. Evil did its worst, and Jesus undoes evil. Last week, I shared with you that on most days, my view of the book of Revelation is what's called the amillennial view. Uh, Ah meaning no, millennial meaning a thousand year reign. Now, that's not to say that as an amillennialist that I don't believe that there's a millennial reign as we see uh, described in the book of Revelation. No, amillennialists believe that the millennial reign, that it began back with the life death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, and it continues until the return of Jesus. So Jesus, in all of this period, he is having his thousand-year reign spiritually through the church in the midst of the evil and the tribulations and the suffering in our world. Now, if you're thinking about this clearly, you might say, wait a minute, Uh, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven, and a millennial reign is a thousand years. So what's going on there? But remember, numbers in the book of Revelation are not always literal. They're often symbolic. And from this perspective, the perspective of amillennialism, Revelation teaches us that the war between God and Satan is already won. (laughs) Even though skirmishes continue on. And this is very similar to when the Allied forces won uh, World War II. They they won at Normandy on D-Day, right? Historians actually look at that day and they say that is when World War II was won. Yet 11 months of warfare continued from D-Day to V-Day, Victory Day. And that's how it is with the cross and the return of Jesus. The presence of sin continues in our world, and yet the power of sin has been defeated at the cross. So friends, sin no longer rules and reigns over you. But as a Christian, you can live differently because you have been rescued from Satan, from sin, and from death. Sin no longer reigns. Jesus does. And that makes all the difference in the world for you. That means that you don't have to be controlled. You don't have to give in to your sin. The presence of sin, the temptation of sin remains, but the power that it had to rule over you as a slave is gone. Jesus is your king, and he has rescued you. 
But what has he rescued us to? Let's look at our third point. God's people loved. Verses 13 to 17. Now, when we talk about God's judgment, it's really easy for us to get sidetracked from his posture towards the world, which is love. Uh, Evil must be taken care of. And God is the only one who has the ability. He's the only one up to the task of dealing with evil once and for all. Yet we also have to remember that God is love and that God loves the world. If we look at verse 14 again, it further describes the redeemed, rescued people of God, the church. And it describes them as those who have endured the tribulation. Now, in my view, uh, I wouldn't see the tribulation as a seven-year extent and period of suffering in the future, but the whole period between the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, and the resurrection of Jesus is a cycle of repeating suffering and tribulation that the church goes through. And this group, the multicultural uncountable number, that is the church that will be around the throne. Verse 14 tells us that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Remember the sacrificial love of Jesus, that he laid down his life and died. And in doing that, he paradoxically conquered evil. Now, the multicultural church follows Jesus, and we too lay down our lives, and paradoxically, we conquer evil as well. That's what Revelation chapter 7 is telling us. And that's what the book of Revelation means when it talks about those who conquer. As Christians, we don't conquer through domination and power like Rome or other power structures. No, as Christians, we conquer through love, and through sacrificially serving others. That is how Christians conquer evil. And what a needed word we have in our world right now, in a world where we try to dominate one another by just yelling louder than one another. With issues like the race issues that we've seen exposed yet again even this week, with issues like disagreements and heated disagreements over how do we return back to life after quarantine, with the hurt that maybe even many of you feel that other people didn't reach out to you the ways you wanted them to in quarantine. All of these issues and more, the Christian response to each of them is sacrificial love. We follow in the steps of the Lamb who sacrificed himself for us. And I'm convinced that the only way that we can love like that is to first be captivated by Jesus's love. (laughs) We have to have his love infuse every part of us because love begets love and love does all to rescue us. So friends, think on the cross and think on it Often, ponder what Jesus did for you. Consider your future. As you live your present, consider your future, that you will live before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter you with his presence. And isn't that what you want in all the craziness of this life? Don't you want to be sheltered from it all by the loving presence of God? And in fact, if you're united with Christ, the Apostle Paul tells you in his letters that your very life is hidden with Christ in God in heaven right now. So this reality of being hidden and sheltered in God's presence is not yet your reality and that you're not there yet. But in a way that's mysterious, you are there right now. You are united with Christ and reflect on the love of God that he would do this for you. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be your shepherd. What beautiful language drawing from John chapter 10 where Jesus tells us that he's the good shepherd. 
and he will guide you to springs of living water. What beautiful parallels to Psalm 23, where the Lord is your shepherd and he'll lead you by those still waters into those green pastures, and God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. The tears of the black communities and the white communities who have wept this week for Ahmad Arbery. The tears of the single ladies in our church and in other churches and in our world who are weeping because they want a family and God hasn't answered their prayers yet. The tears, every single tear from every death and every loss from COVID-19 and every other tear shed throughout history will be wiped from the faces of God's beloved people. Friends, God loves you so much. He has gone to such great lengths to rescue you. And why? To rescue you from Satan, sin, and death, but not just to leave you there, to rescue you and bring you back into a loving relationship with him. Won't you respond to this amazing love Won't you give your life to God and to others in love as well? As we wrap up today, when it comes to suffering, it's easy to focus on the pain and to get stuck. It's also really easy in our suffering to imagine that God is far away and to imagine that we're alone in our suffering. Yet John here in Revelation chapter 7, he invites us to imagine instead when we suffer that we are actually part of a suffering community that follows a suffering Savior. Or to put this in other words, the Apostle Paul invites us when we are in suffering to imagine that we share in the sufferings of Christ. So for Paul, when he suffered, he didn't imagine that God was far away. No, he imagined that Jesus was closer to him than he was to his own skin. And we would do well to do likewise, because it's true. God loves us, and God is working all things, even the evil things of our world, together for the good of those who love him. Sojourn, won't you believe in this God? Won't you follow this Jesus? Friends, my prayer, Sojourn, my prayer for you, Uh, for this week, or we might as well just go ahead and say for the rest of 2020, is this. It comes from Ephesians chapter 3. That God may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen, and let it be.
Sojourn, thank you so much again for joining us this morning. Happy Mother's Day to you all. We hope you have a great day celebrating this day with family, with friends. A couple quick announcements. Uh, be sure to hop on over on SojournChattanooga.com. Check out our COVID-19 resource page. If you are not yet in a community group and you're lonely and you want to get into a community group, you can go on there and you can connect with a group and you can join a group starting out this week. We'd love to see you do that. Also, if you need help or if you'd like to help in any ways, feel free to grab that Loving Your Neighbor form and sign that up. Fill that out so that you would be able to receive help and give help also, if that's what you'd like to do at this point, uh, feel free to hop back over to your email and continue your worship. Continue through giving um, to Jesus through the local church and also continue by praying for our world. We love you, Sojourn. Hope you have a great week. Peace be with you.